Welcome to Ask Me Anything. Our guest today is Dorota Zimno, who is in an innovation and digital transformation expert in the financial sector. And we've met up today to discuss uh, fintech trends, uh, which is particularly relevant in the context of new year uh, and old year coming to a close and new year uh, ahead of us. Uh, so Dorota is a global chair for innovation and technology at G100, uh, which is a consulting company specializing in learning and development, as well as uh, business networking. Am I right? No. <laughs> 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 no, G100 is a, is a, a global organization. It's not really a consultant. It's more of the, of the global network uh, that uh, brings together people from all disciplines around the world with the aim to promote uh, inclusion and diversity and to drive the agenda through inclusion and diversity. It's mainly um, uh, encouraging women to step up in these roles and, and, and come together and share the voice. However, we have also something called the denim partner, which is the man supporting a woman. So we are not exclusive uh, club for women only, etc. It's really about bringing the whole universe together and work together to bring uh, to bring uh, us all towards the same, you know, and unite towards the same goal. And G hundred stands for hundred disciplines, hundred oh. chairs that then that then invite 100 country chairs and then 100 country chairs by the uh, regional chairs, etc. So in general, you know, in our period of time is going to be, grow into the huge, huge global uh, rich community. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very interesting. No, so my mistake then. But you are also experienced in leading digital transformation for different financial companies, both large ones and uh, startups. So would you like to elaborate on this a bit? Yes, so uh, my career started uh, over 20 years ago and that started with, with uh, one of the biggest uh, financial institutions in the world, which was Citi. Um, uh, but then after spending around 10 years in the banking field, I moved to insurance and there I had an opportunity to work with some large companies like AIG or MetLife. Um, and uh, uh, after 2015, where digital transformation truly started to accelerate, uh, there was space. Uh, I, I realized that there is a space for helping uh, many different companies rather than just be focused on driving innovation in one. And therefore, I established my own consultancy that uh, focused on um, digital transformation and innovation. Uh, and we've, uh, we, 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 for, for five years, we helped over 20 uh, clients around the world with some really big and very interesting projects, uh, anything from, uh, from Latvia to Mongolia and the US and, uh, and, and Europe, etc. We, we've been in very different locations. Uh, and uh, uh, yes, and this was the, the time when I also um, got very acquainted with the ecosystem of startups and scale-ups and what was going in this field. And especially I could see myself being a connector between the incumbents, so the big corporates and those startups that were emerging. Uh, and um, yeah, I was uh, attracted and interested in, in, in uh, startup worlds as well. So I, I uh, helped quite a few to grow as well as, uh, you know, being strategic advisor or angel investor, but also being on board of some. Um, and uh, now I am again, with, or, or my recent role was again with the corporate world, but the idea was basically to build a digital lab and the digital ecosystem for the corporate clients. So it's really on, you know, being in between the two worlds and, and uh, through building partnerships is to generate the most of value for clients. For the purpose of our discussion, I thought we might start from considering what innovation is from your perspective, mm -hmm. uh, but also like me personally, I think that we often tend to identify innovation with technology, which is uh, sometimes might uh, 
not necessarily be the case, but because we might use technology still to perpetuate some old patterns uh, uh, when we don't take into account, let's say, ESG standards, uh, it's not really innovative uh, that much. Uh, do you agree? Uh, yeah, I understand where you're coming from. And, uh, you know, um, why in the first place we think innovation is, yeah, is just changing something? Because uh, it really sits in definition, if you like, right? So if you think what is innovation, uh, it comes with Latin innovare, and innovare means uh, basically... Uh, reuse or re reinvent, etc. Right. So, uh, um, from that perspective, if you look at this like that, it's you know, if I can improve something to make it better and make it better with the means that were not there before, that's already fits in definition, you know, of the innovation world. Yeah. Um, however, uh, in my own definition as well, you know. Um, uh, for me, those those improvements which would fit in a in a category of innovation are not really, I, I don't think about them as innovation in my, in my head, you know, it's, it's improvements, it's enhancements, you know, I would call them automations, etc. but not really, you know, disruptive and groundbreaking innovation as this is for me, the definition, right? So to do something we, which basically for me, innovation requires rethinking. Mm -hmm. and, Rethinking in a way, not just like how to do it a little bit better, you know, uh, like how we uh, we talking about fintech. So if you look at the websites that were you know created for banks in 2000, and if you look at them today online on a, on your computer, you will you won't see much difference. Frankly, you won't see much difference. You know, they are okay. They use some technologies, animated banners, this and that, maybe more analytics, la la la. But in general, you know, visually, they are not that much different, really. That is not the innovation for me, right? Just because the skin was changed, etc. For me, the innovation will be when the, you know, the, the, yeah, when we moved from online to mobile, that was an innovation because we, we do banking with a different means or what we do into, you know, when we go into this new trend of embedded finance where everything, you know, finance is a part of the really customer journey. That's, that's, that's a kind of an innovation for me, right? So everything that requires rethinking, you know, recently I spent a few years with automotive, so I, I like using this example, you know, we are not talking Faster horses is not innovation for me. For me, innovation in Henry Ford's words is, is the car, right? Just, just to give that, you know, that perspective or metaphor. Yeah, so in this context, it's interesting uh, how fast innovation can be. Uh, can innovation happen in one year? Well, of course it can, because if you think about, in, you know, like innovation can happen in moment really in one, you know, because it, it depends whether you are looking at, at, you know, spot innovation or where you're looking at innovation, which I prefer looking at as a process. And that's why to your previous question, when you say like, you know, yeah, ESG criteria need to be taken into consideration, sure they, they, they shall be for, it's 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 a process, right? It has impact. It's it it is embedded by technology or empowered by technology, but then it impacts it impacts human behaviors, right? Uh, you know, which then translates into what we like to call every year like customer behavior change and expectations change. It's nothing more but to adoption to new technologies or you know leveraging the opportunities of new technology and so on and so forth. So, so. Everything is underpinned by the new technologies, if you like. Yeah. Uh, but indeed, you know, all the ethical aspects, you know, that come uh, and responsible application of technology is equally important. And that's also part of the innovation process, mm. right? Also, if you think about this, you know, why, for example, companies do innovation? They do innovation or they innovate because they, one of the reasons is to keep ahead of competition, right? Stay, stay um, in the game, basically. If you, you know, that that actually set apart for me the corporate world I've been in, and uh, and the startup world. In a corporate world, we often had this case where we were allocating some big budget for some big change, some you know moving to the new platform. I don't know cloud this and that, right? So we, you know, we spent few years sometimes to move the whole bank on the new platform, for example. And then 
there was kind of a time for, for the bank to kind of catch up, right, with all the other things that they need to need, had put aside for, for a while, while this big project was happening, but they then they had to catch up, right? So it was like big thing and then rest. And then maybe in a few years again, something bigger and then rest, right? And this is some cycle, but it's not really, you know, which keeps you innovating all the time, right? If you want to innovate, that's why the agile and all new practices then were born, right? This is through this, you know, fast fail cycles, right? Um, all the time, because that, that is really, as I say, that is a process. And what you innovate today, you may need to break and rebuild tomorrow again, because you don't know what's, what's around the corner, what new technology will come. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great. So um, we would like to ask you about uh, uh, your opinions on which technologies that are emerging, or maybe they are already there, um, uh, are the most important or potentially most disruptive for finance sector? Mm-hmm. Do you have such in, in your mind? I don't think, first of all, you can you can create the ranking and the list. I know that, you know, in our, like, like especially in this time of the year, everybody likes to publish, like, top, top 10 trends, top 20 trends, and 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 then they list them, right? And uh, you, you know, if you review, you would, you would, tend to agree with most of it, right? That, yeah, it is, it is, it is right. I think um, that uh, you are right by saying that some of these technologies exist. They've been existing for quite a while. What I feel right now, they are over some flex point and now they are really becoming mainstream or they are really becoming to generate value for, 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 for those who are reaching for those technologies. And by such, I mean, for example, artificial intelligence. It's nothing new. It's been there. If you look at the you know, trends for a for, for few years back, artificial intelligence, AI will be there, right? But the way how we can use it today by, uh, you know, versus what we could do a few years ago is very different. And why it's so? Uh, partially because the competences caught up with the with the trend itself. So technology was there, but there weren't enough talent on the market to know how to use it. There weren't enough standards to know how to use it. The technologies were emerging, but they were not compatible with each other, right? So the standards, you know, how to use it were not really the regulations sometimes were not there. So even though, you know, in banking world, chatbots were there for a long time, but not always you could use them, for example, to support clients because all the regulations with GDPR or RODO, et cetera, right? Those were, uh, those were you know, to catch up with so that we can fully, fully uh, benefit from that. Cloud computing, another example, right? We had to catch up with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, regulatory uh, uh, ch- challenges, solve them before we could, we could really, you know, move to the, t- to the technology. So artificial intelligence for sure. Um, uh, I am a huge enthusiast of the uh, DLTs and blockchain. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, even completing my PhD in this topic right now. And, uh, and again, you know, I, I tend to uh, look at the blockchain uh, curve a little bit like through my career when I joined Citibank in 1999, uh, very first or first big project and, and responsibility I had was uh, uh, to launch online banking, which was ground, you know, built from the ground. Uh, it wasn't like I could take one off the shelf and implement because nothing was existing like that. So we had to reinvent and build from the scratch, right? And I remember launching the online banking. A lot of other people were saying, no, 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 it's not going to take off, not worth the effort. You know, there was quite a time before people started even moving into online space, you know, putting their websites out there, etc. So there was a flex point, you remember, dot, uh, you know, bubble uh, crisis. Then it fall, and then, you know, the phoenix arise from, from the ashes, right? And the whole new opportunity for internet emerged like with that, after that flex point. And I think the similar thing we can experience right now with blockchain it was a lot of hype, hype of we can do, we can do, we can do, but, but there weren't really tangible, you know, uh, benefit generated back then yet, and examples that it could really prove on a scale it could work. Having said that, lots of companies were working on blockchain as 
some of the companies, you know, right now made the coming out with the metaverses. I, I'm sure we will talk about this in a minute. So they set about, you know, they, they work on blockchain, but it wasn't really public. They were doing their own tests, etc. right? And now out of sudden, we are like awake with, oh, this solution, that solution, where is it coming? Like, like you know, it's, it's appearing like, you know, like mushroom after the rain, but but the reason is that people have been working on this for a long time, but now the maturity point in which, you know, the companies start feeling like, okay, now it's at the stage where we can really take it, you know, for our business, we can implement, we can build solutions. So definitely blockchain and, and you know, on this, on this technology and the trend, you can build a lot of things that are happening, you know, the centralized currencies and, and finance in general, right? Current um, cryptocurrencies, you know, um, uh, NFTs and, and so on and so forth. Lots of lots of things will be built, but as an underpinning technology will be blockchain. Mm -hmm. Great. So I would like to ask uh, like an additional question uh, mm -hmm. specifically uh, regarding uh, blockchain. Uh, and, mm -hmm. and it's quite interesting, not sure if you what's your opinion here that um, uh, the rise of the blockchain as a you know like a, a foundation for cr cryptocurrencies is kind mm -hmm. of a ph phenomenal because it actually happened like uh, a side of the main financial sector somehow um, so it's a, it's a very interesting case in which it came up from not from the sector itself but actually from mm -hmm. the people outside yeah. of the sector and created somehow uh, entirely new space. And the financial sector actually has mm -hmm. to catch up with this. Yeah. And you think about what actually do with this, because my thinking is that in most cases, they don't have an idea what to do with this and how to adapt to this. Uh, mm -hmm. So, But this is like very specific phenomena, phenomenon, I guess. It's, it's a very unique thing that happened around cryptocurrencies and blockchain. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, um, do we really know if this didn't come from uh, from financial services experts? We don't, because you know, if you think who who launched the Bitcoin and the protocol, it's Satoshi Nakamoto. And uh, for for what I know, we don't know who uh, that is, whether it's a person or organization. There are lots of you know theories there, uh, etc. But but. In, in fact, we don't know. So it may happen. <laughs> so, you know, so that's that's my first comment in that sense. But you are right. Uh, uh, you see, this is phenomenal, you could call, but this is not unseen before. If you think about the crisis of 2008, and you think about what happened back then, there was a moment in time where, you know, lots of people lost job in the, in the, in the current jobs like Lehman Brothers and, and so on. They had a lot of money to invest. They had a lot of good ideas. They were really angry with how financial services were developing to let get to that point when they lost their jobs where things fa start falling. The customer's expectations were shifting. Uh, trust was going down, etc. If you think about this environment, right, it was like, you know, that was the environment that's basically generated all the trend of fintechs, etc. because there was enough of this critical mass for, you know, to, to, to and, and, and the, 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 there were enough of components and blocks to start building something new and disrupting. And if you think cryptocurrencies, as you said, even though for me, blockchain, I mean, it's so much more, right? But, but yes, but it also, you know, it, it kind of started with cryptocurrencies, etc. So I understand why you're asking that. So from that perspective, it's the same thing. You know, people started, you know, being really upset and angry, if you like, about all the inefficiencies and the ways uh, how the world is not democratized, you know, how the, uh, you know, big banks are benefiting from, you know, from lengthy processes of, uh, I don't know, cross-border transfers, etc., and exploring technologies, you know, show that there are other ways to do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so is it a phenomenon? Yes, but this is really a response to you know if you carefully watch the watch the need, watch the watch the you know uh, kind of uh, you know what what are people feeling and requests etc. You would you would see this coming because it's not like you know uh, it's not like it emerged from nothing. Same like in two thousand eight after the crisis, you know the the lending 
basically like bloom up, you know, and so many solutions appear. Why? Because people were, you know, the, the uh, banks strict the criteria for giving uh, money to people and people are still in need of money, right? And they couldn't secure them from banks any longer. So the need perpetuated solutions, right? Which were then built and today they are, you know, they're seen as a, as a standard in a way. And, you know, they they cooperate those financial and non-financial lending companies, they now cooperate, right? But but this emerged. So uh, so I think, you know, what's, what's, what's important is in my opinion, and I really would like everybody to encourage doing that, but also I, I, I see this, you know, as a, as a very big, an interesting field is to look at the convergence of different technologies. And really at the end of the day, you know, uh, really look at, at, at who is at the end of the, of the line when it comes to all these solutions, you know, who is the recipient of all these solutions. And if you think about this, you know, one big shift that is happening right now in financial services, but not only, is that finally the financial institutions where they benchmark themselves, they don't benchmark themselves against other financial institutions any longer. You know, I remember working with banks a few years ago still would, would ask them, who is your competitor? And I would be given a list of other banks, right? Mm -hmm. You know, on, of top 10 of that bank. Today, you know, I, I hear already answers like, oh, everybody, like Netflix is our competitor and Uber is our competitor. And, you know, and yes, it is. Yes, it is. We finally catch up with that. We finally start realizing that, under, understanding that. And that is a huge shift. Uh, because now, um, you know, if you think about this, that is influencing, again, almost everything. One of such area will be uh, talent. Think about talent, right? Right now, the, the war for talent is, you know, banks are headhunting for, for greatest talents in, in uh, Amazons and Facebooks, right? No more in other banks as much as, as they want the whole new way of thinking, for example. So it's 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 phenomenal, but I think, you know, just to bring it back home to, to your uh, to your point, is it is not something that we couldn't couldn't anticipate, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so we are talking about technologies and how they can you know, disrupt or maybe drive or be used to bring some change or innovation in the fin in the financial space or fintech more specifically. So, but, you know, there could be like a long road uh, from the moment uh, when technology is, uh, you know, is on the market and we can use it uh, to the real use case when we can actually turn this into some, you know, business model or, uh, yes. uh, and, um there is can can you know last many years as you said before uh, before something can be can be turned into the business and it yes. really works um so we would like to ask you about uh about like your your recent experience or knowledge about like this new business models or emerging mm -hmm. business models in the mm -hmm. fintech or more general mm -hmm. finance space that mm -hmm. you think are interesting and maybe are telling us something about the trends? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so um, again, uh, to my previous point, if you look at the convergence of, the, of, of, of different fields, you will see how the trends are coming, you know, uh, from one field to the other. And it's not like one stream only, by the way, you know, it's, it's like, Every direction, if you like. But one of the of the trends in terms of the business model we can see right now is emerging uh, or basically becoming more um, uh, mainstream is the is the subscription based model, right? Mm -hmm. Whether, whether we are talking about, I spent the uh, last few years with Volvo, uh, and you know, in the past, what would be the model of, of, of you owning the truck would be to buy it right and then run company but today uh you know the or or the future model includes the subscriptions right so if you if you have the smaller job today you will run the smaller truck and tomorrow you will uh, run the bigger truck right why to own them all so it's uh, and as you can see it's very much in the in the field of the of the geek like kind of a shared economy in a way right uh, 
now it's entering much bigger environment and much bigger scale, right? It's not to share the, uh, you know, the small things any longer. It's really, you know, the subscription model for big things. It's not the Netflix uh, only, but it's a Netflix model, if you like, you know, in market, we have this new um, entrant bank, uh, ION, uh, that first uh, was created in, in Belgium, uh, um, created by Wojtek Subire and the team, so the ex, you know, the uh, Alior uh, founder as well. And um, if you think about this, they also, you know, uh, kind of disrupt the market with this subscription-based model, where you have one fee and nothing else, right? Rather mm-hmm. than pay for each transaction and every every use of card and whatnot, right? So so the, the subscription model is definitely, in my opinion, uh, is definitely, you know, one of the of the business models that will that will uh, be kind of a, you know will emerge and will become more mainstream. The other thing is definitely um, again not new, but but I think it's you know it, it it's finding its place if you like. It's all these peer to peer models, right? Mm-hmm. You know, those were. In the insurance space, there were some models emerging and some companies emerging when, you know, the uh, communities would come together and vote for each other, or there's a company called Vote Me or solution called Vote Me. There there is about, you know, one is guarantor for the other and and in that you can expand your credit kind of, you know, worthiness, et cetera, and you can allow for, you can get more financial support if you need that, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this peer to peer, uh, it's a little bit more complicated because there are regulatory, uh, you know, uh, the regulatory environment is not yet fully embracing this and fully ready. And there's a lot of questions there, etc. But in general, um, I feel, and to, to your point about cryptocurrencies and then those tokens and everything, which is spinning off that is definitely relying on, on, uh, on these peer-to-peer models and, mm-hmm. and uh, open, mm-hmm. open models. Yeah, so we were talking about subscriptions. So I, I have to ask this question. Sorry, this is a, something mm-hmm. that was not planned. <laughs> but I, I really, I have a theory, and I would like to, to, mm-hmm. to share this quickly. Share this with you. It's a simple one. Um, so probably a wrong one at the same time. And maybe you can you can help me validate this uh, because uh, I recently we were discussing with uh, Maugajata this. Uh, uh, the nature of the subscription uh, model and what is actually driving this. And uh, of course, you know, the first thing that came, uh, uh, came to my mind is that uh, maybe this is because of the, you know, it's more because of the affordability, because it's more affordable. Mm-hmm. So you create like subscription model and then you can have more, 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 more clients because your service uh, is more affordable. But, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but actually, I'm thinking right now that probably is more driven by the, uh, uh, the 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 nature how the value is being actually created and what is the structure of the cost in the companies um, that are creating values and they they sell the values um, uh, uh, sell their value their service in a subscription model. Uh, so to, to give some examples, so I think that uh, what is happening right now is that if more and more services are based on the uh, the work of people and their talent and their knowledge, uh, so the, the the main cost very often of of of, of uh, creating the value as a business is actually the cost of employing em- employees and people that are mm-hmm. behind those those services. So and this uh, one factor. Uh, drives the subscription model because if your business has to be sustainable from the financial perspective and your main costs are people, then it's very natural to get the value uh, in the subscription because the cost structure is also very frequent in, on a monthly mm-hmm. or weekly basis. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is the idea why this is emerging because of the structure of the costs of the company not the affordability part? Well, I feel it's uh, it's where the two kind of forces meet. On one, on one side, you, you touch upon it uh, to some extent, is the end consumer mm-hmm. demands this. Why? Because they demand something easy, uh, you know, almost seamless, uh, you know, 
and, and, and really personalized in a way, right? But, but really easy to use. And if you think about this, if you have this, I don't know, uh, you know, bank uh, offering you card, but then you need to remember, make a le at least three transfers this month, otherwise we charge you and this and that. And you, you just cannot cope with it, right? So you as a customer, you require something easier, uh, more in control of it, etc. And the subscription model provides that. On the other hand, you're right. The, bank, uh, the companies are looking for for uh, for their way of how to how to provide a more sustainable model. And again, I don't think it's one size fits all in that area because if you look at the bank, um, I can see some of these of these of these things. Yeah, there's a heavy loaded you know staff cost there, etc. And therefore, that could be you know the yeah stable revenue generated through the subscriptions. Mm -hmm. uh, if I look at the final uh, the, at the Volvo financial services where I was, uh, one of the elements that was driving this also is the uh, uh, is the amount of asset that is being available out there, right? So towards uh, Malgajata's previous point about ESG and being you know being like responsible for you know universe etc. Uh, with shrinking amount of the drivers that uh, a lot of other challenges. You know, they realize, and, and especially in COVID time, the supply chain uh, problems that emerge uh, basically put a lot of pressure on being able to deliver all the assets, so the trucks or something, and produce them in the, in the amount that is required on the market. Then mm -hmm. there's also a finding that, uh, you know, the transportation is not that efficient, really, which data has showed us, because there's only that amount of the fully loaded trucks running and and many of them are just like you know the huge trucks with a little load because that's what what the customer you know the companies would have on on on, on uh, um, to to use so if you look at the, this from this perspective then you understand that the subscription model even for financial services but in that field is around you know like who owns the asset who wants to own the asset right mm -hmm. and, Know, and uh, where is the cost base of that uh, seating? So, so I don't think it's one um, size fits all. But what you are saying is absolutely right. I feel that a lot is with streamlining the cost base on both, mm -hmm. if you like. Yeah. So you have, uh, you know, your experience in automotive, and uh, um, and we were saying about subscription. So it would be uh, a scene not to ask a question about what do you think. Uh, how how the future of subscription models in the automotive will go, in your opinion, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, especially here in Poland, we see that mm -hmm. there is more and more uh, offerings uh, mm, uh, to, you know, just to rent a car, uh, mm -hmm. which is like replacing like a standard, uh, you know, credit model mm -hmm. or leasing model before. So, mm -hmm. uh, so what, what do you think? What will be happening in this space? Um, yeah. are, are we going into this one direction in which there will be only rental at some point of time in 100 years and nobody will be owning anything? What do you think? <laughs> First of all, uh, you know, it's a challenging question probably for the whole uh, new conversation, just uh, from the perspective that you, you gave an example of one country. I had the opportunity to see... Uh, to see uh, numerous researchers in which they show that even culturally different markets are, you know, we're on different, uh, differently, if you like, to the, to the shared economy. And what is, what is, you know, in the UK, uh, it is a blooming really field, you know, like you can share almost anything right now, really, you can share your doc, you can share, you know, you can put on the, on the platform, uh, you know, the, the designers back and share this with others, et cetera, you know, and rent it to others. Uh, there are platforms of, you know, aggregators of platforms of sharing already. So, so it's like multi-level, right? In Poland, as you said, you know, um, uh, there were many concepts tested, but they didn't take off ground as much as, as, as I believe it was hoped for, you know, that people would totally move into, uh, into you know, like just renting. And the reason for that is it's not just economical factors that count, but also some stat st status, you know, like privilege that you have this, you know, you have a guy 
why not to have a car in there and show others I, I can I can own one, right? Etc. So it's, it's from that level of ownership is a little bit complicated. Having said that, you know, where is this model going to? I think uh, in general, this, um, uh, you know, shared ownership, if you like, is definitely the trend that is going to spin off. And we see this already, you know, because um, on one hand, uh, we are talking about goods. Would you replace something you can afford today for something that you can rent? So car, you, you could buy, but maybe you should rent. That's the one trend. But what we are seeing right now, and it's, it's accelerating with the speed of light, I'd say, is that can you can you own a little bit of the you know the I don't know sunflower of Van Gogh painting? You mm. know, share that, right? Can you buy the token that you know of this tokenized painting, and can I then have a value, you know like the, the the share of the of the famous painting or whatever that is, right? Of the field in the metaverse or whatnot. Now that is also based in a way on ownership uh, with some maybe subscription you know model where the value grows you you grow with it etc so you see so in that in that again we may look at the trend of subscription today but you ask me about what will be in 10 years i don't think that this model today is, is going to last for long it mm -hmm. will be kind of a 1.0 of what we will see in 10 years 5.0 of something which we don't even imagine today mm -hmm definitely will originate from the subscription, but I, I wouldn't be brave enough to speculate what could that be in 10 years, frankly. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for those insights, Sarah. Uh, so let's uh, then uh, um, come back to FinTech itself mm -hmm. and this space. And we would like to ask you uh, a little bit about, you know, uh, about your predictions about the future. Uh, let's start from uh, from uh, uh, near future, so next year. Um, uh, so, what do you think will be will be actually the 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 hot thing? What will be really emerging, mm -hmm. uh, not only from the perspective of being popular, but actually making a real change, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the financial space. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, one of the really important things that we will see and a lot of new solutions and developments will be generated from ESG and all the you know, criteria that the uh, uh, you know, recent COP and the previous COPs agreed and, you know, and the impact and uh, again, demands and expectations of clients meeting the obligations uh, of, of, uh, of uh, um, companies, right, if you like. So there will be a lot of, you know, like things like, uh, uh, you know, providing customers with a carbon footprint, what, whatever they generate, et cetera, right? So that they are more aware and they can act accordingly, et cetera, will be, uh, will be such examples, which we already have on the market. Well, I, I, I think it will just grow in importance and scale and more mm -hmm. and more things like this will emerge. Uh, then I think that there will be a lot of things happening in the cybersecurity space definitely in financial services. And that is for several reasons. As we are moving more and more into the digital world, and when I say the digital world, I really mean not just digitalizing or digitizing, right? So, so making in digital form the, 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 you know, the otherwise the assets, the physical assets. But what I mean here is we're really entering, right? We are really stepping into the, 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 the digital world of avatars and others, right? And as we move there, obviously you can see how big challenge the privacy, data privacy, uh, and and the data protection and and all the identity protection and who whose identity that really is you know who are you in that digital and so on and so forth this is a huge area that will have a lot of uh, I, I, I suspect a lot of development in that field also because the you know regulations are changing and uh, constantly right and the, and uh, I see in some really advanced economies like again in the UK you know there's a really very close partnership between between businesses and the regulatory environment to work together towards those solutions so that's why 
if we ask ourselves the question why they are so efficient and often the solutions are born in the UK, that's the reason as well, because sandboxes and everything is there and supporting and they kind of like meeting together uh, and, and brainstorming together how to how to use the power of, of this and how to protect consumers, but then don't stop innovation. So definitely, you know, definitely we talked about uh, previously the, the uh, blockchain uh, and more and more things in that space is going to happen. You know, people want to uh, invest in cryptocurrencies and understand it better, etc. So there will be tools, you know, platforms for investing. Uh, Farther still powered by data because if you think about this, this is really fuel to everything, right? So uh, ever more advanced and and smart solutions for, for 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 data will be there. Then what we will also see, you know, it's called already like embedded finance. So basically, financial services are kind of underpinning a lot of things, but they are almost transparent and seamless, right? Or provided in the ecosystem. But if um, if you look at the recent reports uh, about, you know, the fastest growing uh, startups, fintech startups, for example, where they really fit. So it's, uh, I can see quite a lot, and I think top of the list are the companies like Uncap, for example, and others that provide solutions for e-commerce. So the, 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 the very tight cooperation between e-commerce field and the retail field, et cetera, and the financial services is definitely there. And if that, I would also say that there would be a lot of uh, 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 a lot of uh, mm, solutions coming, still new solutions coming with uh, with the payments. If you mm -hmm. see what Ripple is doing, for example, in the payment space, you know every day it's almost a, a different news about advancing on something. You know you can only see um, that this field is just really preparing for something bigger. And then like I said also, um, you know. Um, what we may feel is just an infant stage because it was just announced, announced, which I mentioned before, the metaverses. I feel like it's really now going to be like very, very quick, you know, a quick road of tests and learns and, you know, and people will, will try to find the space uh, there. I've seen already H&M launching the metaverse store. Mm -hmm. uh, Basically, it's a test at the moment, but you can already, you know, uh, kind of get, get in the store and, 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 and test yourself how the, this metaverse will look like. Um, it's still at the, at the level where you and your avatar is the same identity. Uh, so, so you are representation of yourself in the virtual world. But what we are really talking about and what for me is this you know, it's mind blowing kind of a future is where you will have your digital twins. Mm -hmm. You will have your clones that are built from your DNA, if you like, in terms of like, you know, they, they have the same data, so they feel the same way, they make the same conclusions, but your digital twin will be able to act on your behalf in a way, right? So you can ask your digital twin to sit in a meeting and take a note while you are doing, I don't know, the baking a cake or playing with your kids, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you double yourself in a way, right? Because it all belongs to you. But, but as you can see, you know, the question emerges, okay. So if I ask my digital twin to do the transfers for me while I'm doing something else, even driving, right? Mm -hmm. Like responsible for it, right? And, and, on and where is the data privacy and everything sitting? So if you think about this, I think this this been worked on for a long time already. So let's not think it's like you know it will just emerge now because now people learn about this. It's been there for a while, you know, people tested this for a while, and I think right now will be the time when when we will see those uh, these solutions come on the surface and start being offered to customers and uh, everything I can say, it's like, it's gonna be super exciting. Yeah, so uh, I would like to ask you a question um, regarding this, uh, the whole metaverse concept. And mm -hmm. because you mentioned this uh, thing, security, as when you imagine security um, uh, from the financial services perspective, it's okay, you understand what it means that, you know, nobody can can actually use your money and uh, act on your behalf. Um, but when we think about solutions uh, like metaverse or, you know, we, I'm not sure if we are ready yet to understand what kind of a security type of problems we will have there. 
like the yeah. you know, psychological security of uh, every single person that is there. That's sounds like you know i can give you one example you know if you're in gaming let's say you 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 are you know you're a warrior and you 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 fight it very you know uh, like like for that sword you you own now right and you have this sword and now somebody hacks into this game and steals that sword and sells in other metaverse for for hell a lot of money right to that another warrior that's i know it sounds like what <laughs> But these are the real problems. Like, yeah. you know, who to blame, right? Is it, are those the warriors you blame? <laughs> are those the hackers? You know, like, where is the where is the challenge? But as as much as you may be laughing on that, you know, if you have uh, NFTs today and you own some 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 shares, etc., and somebody you know like will will steal this from you, you know, like it's a, mm -hmm. it's a real problem, right? Is so from that perspective, it's for example, it's one example of, of where the security, you know, may, may be. Like, uh, you know, I've I've read recently somebody already bought a, a yacht in metaverse, which costs like millions, and it's not has not been built yet. Mm -hmm. Bought the yacht in metaverse of the of the kind of plan. Now, what if that? yacht is being stolen like can you buy the insurance for your virtual yacht in metaverse <laughs> for example here comes the fintech right insurtech like do we yeah. have <laughs> for you know and yes we are you, you're right to 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 smile at uh, these concepts and so, so am i but at the same time you know what's what's really you know super exciting but also super you know scary is that this is not the question of the future. Mm -hmm. I think I ask myself, are we, are we late? <laughs> Aren't we late? Exactly. So, you know, this is very interesting. Um, that there is an interesting illustration of the problem when you look at the cryptocurrencies and the blockchain, mm -hmm. you know, because you have this like huge, let's say like, and this is quite natural everywhere, but you have like this huge knowledge gap, uh, uh, when you look at the, you know, like a common uh, cryptocurrency owner, um, yeah. the knowledge uh, about how actually this works, mm -hmm. and what is the uh, uh, what is the actual risk, you know, uh, behind uh, this, how easy Bitcoin or any crypto can be stolen because it can be very easily stolen, like physically, mm -hmm. let's say, uh, if you are not s secured enough, but it's very hard to understand for most of the cryptocurrency uh, users what actually is happening there. Yeah. yeah. So most of the people, of course, they have some simple, uh, you know, understanding of this, and this is quite natural, and it's okay. It works with everything, yeah. you know, with medicine, yeah. with, you know, with three G, five G, you know, no, but very little uh, understand uh, what uh, yeah. how actually this works. Um, so uh, I'm just wondering how, you know, how much uh, risk or uh, uh, problem is potentially there if this gap will be, you know, mm -hmm. bigger and bigger between uh, people that are using some of so, such solutions and, and, uh, and people that actually understand how it works in practice. Yeah. Uh, because the gap creates this risk of being somehow you know, unaware of what you are doing. And you have to, of course, trust someone. So you start mm -hmm. trusting, you know, crypto exchanges, you try, yeah. you trust uh, crypto wallets, providers, but you have to trust them. And yeah. so the question is, if there is al already an uh, infrastructure of a trust ready to, uh, to people to be secure in this space, yeah. I'm just wondering. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh it is happening, right? It is. Uh, I mean, there, are, there. Are, you, you touch upon so many, uh, so many, you know, kind of angles that I don't even know how to answer. <laughs> simply, in a way, because you know, yeah, you're right. You know, investing. It's always been like uh, risk based, right? So, so mm -hmm. you know, you have a huge appetite for risk. You go for you know for for bigger options. But if you think mainstream will move only when it's like stable and more ready, etc. Right. So and then trust me, if those solutions are already there, banks and other institutions will make 
make sure that they educate the customers because it would be in the interest for customers to take yeah. up these new products, right? So from that perspective, I think that, but you are right that this gap is there and, you know, and it's not that many people that will understand or embrace this fully, et cetera. And, and it is a challenge. I, I can see why you're saying that, you know, I started uh, my first journey with, uh, with uh, blockchains in like 2015, uh, ish uh you know i thought that i know everything about this <laughs> you know because it was early in the days and you could understand you know mining concepts and everything and and consensuses and protocols and today uh, oh my god you know it's like internet growing if i know one percent i'm lucky <laughs> it's like it's spinning up so quickly it's impossible to know more uh, mm-hmm. everything and be an expert in everything so um so I think from one perspective, that's why also uh, some of the, you know, of the natural environments like banks, for example, are not like rushing with everything, all the solutions, because this regulatory environment, and I'm not saying regulations are here to kill the concept, but as you can see, it's really important, you know, to make sure that there is some framework, that there is even simple things like interoperability between different blockchains right B- different protocols like uh, how they can talk to each other it's more technical but it is really important because otherwise you know what if you i don't know if you own some assets and then you want to spend them and then somebody does not accept them because they can <laughs> are not compatible etc here is a challenge right so so there's a lot of a lot of uh, uh, things to be you know, still addressed and and uh, and um, and at the same time, you know, as people try to solve them, you know, the new technologies and new ideas are emerging. So it's it, it feels like a race. It feels overwhelming. Um, and yes, and uh, that probably is uh, uh, to some extent gonna be solved with those intermediaries that will you know that will have some specialized knowledge and will help you to understand some and will provide you with solutions like invest with us and we'll take care of your investment, right, of cryptos, etc. This will definitely be the case. Um, uh, if you look, for example, at some solutions State Street offers, um, one of the, in my opinion, more advanced banks in terms of testing new blockchain solutions, uh, you know, you will see that they are exactly preparing for that, for providing, you know, support. Um, uh, so, yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's like a constantly moving machine, you know, like moving mm-hmm. forward. And as it is spinning forward inside, it's also you know, lots of lots of solutions being being solved. But uh, one thing I want to say is that definitely it's the time to be inside. You know, the, or we merge with all these trends. It's not like it's the time to sit and watch. Is that it's really the time to put your hands into it and test mm-hmm. them. Uh, you know buy one uh, one million of the coin just for, for yourself to you know to see how it works etc you know it's a simple thing you can do and not very costly just to start understanding how this how this all works so it's a time where we, you know to stay on the top of trends you really need to test and learn rather than just sit and wait for somebody to kind of like explain these words to you but yeah. I don't think it's 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 gonna happen. And and what I really value is to look at the very wide perspectives. Like you know, you see, I've been with banking, but then I went to automotive. Uh, I couldn't appreciate enough when I joined Volvo Financial Services back then how much I will learn and how many things I will I will realize and how it will expand my horizon about thinking about convergence of industries, technologies. Mind blowing, mind absolutely mind blowing experience. So again, I'd say you know like reach out for the book. You would never think about you know could help or would interest you, and you may be surprised you know how much it may expand your horizons. Thank you, thank you, Dorota. You you couldn't have put it better how we should approach uh, innovation. Thank you for your inspiring insights. I think this is the moment for us to finish and. Uh, think about uh, the next book to read (laughs) yeah there is a pile for me waiting so not not, not a difficult for me to pick it's difficult which to pick rather than if (laughs) yeah definitely thank you very much for having me really this conversation thank you